So, hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for the last Civics Y'all training. My name is Ivy Major McDowell. I am the Regional Field Coordinator for Austin Central Texas and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And joining me on this training to help with hosting this will be Rick and Hannah. Please go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi there, uh, I'm Rick Alvon. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and uh, my title is the Central Texas Organizer, Campus Organizer for Texas Rising. And hey everyone, my name is Hannah Hughes. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Central Texas Field Manager for Texas Rising. Thanks, you too. So right now I'm gonna start our presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen real, real quick. Okay, so we are discussing today defunding the police, um, joining fellow Texans calling for investment in communities. Um, just before we get started, I would like to say that we are not experts on, on this topic, nor are we the ones leading the efforts on the grounds. However, we know this, this is such an important conversation right now, but also um, for years now, and we want to make sure as Texas Rising, we provide the space um, to talk about this topic um, how young people can get involved in defunding the police and also how we can advance um, anti-racism. Um, so in this training, what we're gonna be covering is first a brief history of policing, um, then going into a definition and understanding of defunding the police and what is the police budgets happening right now in local cities in Texas. Um, then we're going to actually have a great conversation with local organizers. Um, we're going to be joined by Austin Justice Coalition as well as Texas Organizing Project. And so excited to have that conversation get started. And then finally, we have um, a list of calls to actions for ways that you can get involved in this work. And so before we get that started, I'm gonna just say our belief statement. So Texas Rising, we believe that all Texans should have the right to live their lives and build their future without being targeted by law enforcement because of their race. We wanna see an end to racial disparities at every level of the system. We will continue to work in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement for the protection and liberation of Black lives. Thank you so much, Ivy. Um, so before we get into the current calls to action, I want to take some time to discuss how we got here. Um, that includes discussing the history and role of police in the United States. Because for those who know me, y'all know I gotta talk about the history of things. Um, so the purpose, first and foremost, the purpose of police is to protect property and maintain the current social structure. Uh, stretching back to the English colonies, um, what is now the United States in the 1600s, the earliest forms of police began in cities whose economies were centered around shipping and trading property, um, like Boston and New York. Uh, the police were not structured the way they are today in that um, they were really only uh, made for people uh, who owned private companies. And they, were, they would hire everyday people to simply defend their property. This included defending the institution of slavery. Uh, police were given the task of ensuring the enslavement of black lives was protected and that any resistance to that enslavement was put down. Uh, Going further into the United States history, particularly in the American South, police forces were known as slave patrols. Um, and they would do the same thing of surveilling black lives uh, and ensuring resistance to enslavement uh, was put down. After the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment, many former slave patrollers and former Confederate soldiers moved into local police departments to enforce local and statewide laws, including black codes and Jim Crow laws, which meant that the surveillance of black people continued um, and further, because of the exception of in the 13th Amendment uh, that states people can be forced uh, into enslavement if they are convicted for a crime, Southern states with, unfortunately, Texas leading the way, uh, created the convict leasing system. Uh, for those who don't know, that system allowed for state and county prisons to pretty much rent inmates out to private businesses um, and private plantations for the sake of free labor. Um, and this system continues today in similar forms of what many call the prison industrial complex. Um, looking more specifically at Texas itself um, and its police system and its history policing, um, as white people moved into Texas in the early 1800s, they created a form of police that later became known as the Texas Rangers. This police force killed many indigenous people and Mexicans in Texas in order to 
take their land and settle Texas. Once Texas became its own country and then part of the United States, the Texas Rangers would become part of the state government as you know them today as the top cops. And all throughout the early 1900s, the Texas Rangers would continue their attacks against communities of color, especially Mexican communities throughout the state, particularly along the US-Mexico border. In the 1920s though, when the United States passed uh, their first official immigration laws, the National Border Patrol was formed to replicate those brutal tactics of the Texas Rangers. And so we still see those legacies today within the Border, border Patrol agencies and other police forces in Texas. And um, thank you, Rick. And so to continue on this uh, timeline um, and going to a more national look at policing, um, as the United States industrialized and cities expanded, unfortunately, the police uh, departments also expanded. Uh, in response to the growing unions, strikes, and broader labor movement throughout the United States, police departments grew to defend the property of companies and large corporations while maintaining big emphasis like law and order <laughs> um, in cities and rural areas. Such law and order usually meant breaking strikes, crushing protests, and jailing those who caused what they saw as disorder. Uh, as the 1900s continued, Black Southerners and immigrants from across the world began moving to the northern and western U.S. cities, and they were met with violence, including violence from the police. In response to this race-based violence, amongst other forms of discrimination, Black activists and organizers jump-started the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. And while the civil rights movement made significant gains nationally, uh, those gains were met with further brutality by the local police. Uh, the surveillance and targeting of civil rights groups by the federal government and racist policies such as the war on drugs in the 1970s. The war on drugs was made under the guise of law and order, claiming that the goal was to tackle drug usage and addiction, but instead it led to the further surveillance of black communities and communities of color, as well as mass incarceration um, of black and brown folks. Instead of handling it like a public health crisis, police departments were militarized and continued to terrorize black communities, which further expanded into the 1990s under the 1994 crime bill. And all throughout these developments, police departments and individual police officers were never held accountable for their damaging actions against the black community. So we wanted to kind of go through the entire history of policing uh, so that we can have a better understanding of the broader history, of course, and the role that policing has had throughout our entire US history um, and have a better understanding of why the Black Lives Matter movement came to be. Uh, while the Black Lives Matter movement started in 2013 after the murder of Trayvon Martin, it's clear that the struggle between police departments and Black communities in this country has been going on way before 2013. Yeah, um, and the key point about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement that we wanted to make um, is that it really gained momentum because of social media uh, and the hashtags have by organizers, uh, Alicia Garza, uh, Patrice Colors and Opal Um That digital activism and on the ground protesting has allowed us and people all across the world really to see the injustices that black people and black and people of color uh, face at the hands of police. The movement calls out the police brutality and systemic racism that has caused the recent deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, Tony McDade, and, his, and many like thousands of other violent incidents that happen to black people every day that aren't reported or given the same outrage and justice they deserve. It makes clear that black lives, which are seen as without value within white supremacy, are important to everyone else's liberation. Given the disproportionate impact state violence has on black lives, we must understand that when black people in this country get free, everybody gets free. Uh, this movement can uh, and will continue online in the streets as we are seeing today, especially during this time of COVID-19. We, you know, we wanna stress that even if someone can't do in-person actions for health reasons, they still have a critical role in the movement, even if it's online, because that's the way this movement really started. And um, while the Black Lives Matter movement is way more than just about policing, um, a major focus is putting an end to the brutalization of Black people and of all people by our police. Um, and so one of the many strategies that has been gaining momentum is to defund the police and invest in our communities. So uh, we have seen reforms such as banning of chokeholds, warnings before shooting, or a duty to intervene, um, all of which have failed to prevent the murders of Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, and so many others. Um, and that is why defending the police has gained so much momentum, because many across the country are realizing that police reform is simply not enough. Um, 
attacking the police does not mean an immediate removal of funding for police departments. Instead, it means moving funds from police to other public programs, such as housing, healthcare, employment, education, and truly anything that empowers our communities, which policing does not. Um, studies have shown that the increase in policing, including the militarization of police, uh, does not significantly curb crime. Uh, but what does decrease crime is community health. So that means better jobs, access to quality education and healthcare, and stable housing. So on this next um, portion, we can see uh, the city budgets of the six main cities that we work in and we all call our homes. Um, and if you just kind of take a little gander, you can see that over a third of the city budgets for all six of these cities um, is dedicated to their police departments. And it's not uh, something to kind of sneeze at. It is literally like hundreds of millions of dollars go into policing and all these places that we call our homes. Um, so it's no stretch of the imagination to think that by defunding these police departments, the other sectors of our lives and of city budgets could be truly changed for the better. Um, I know that we have a little graphic from Ben and Jerry's ice cream. We love them. Um, that I think is a really good visual demonstration that the police have clearly more than enough funds to give back to the communities that they protect. Um, and I think that is a great future that, that we are all fighting for and looking towards. And so speaking of fighting for and looking towards things, um, now we will be speaking with organizers who have been working to change this system and address the issues of police brutality locally. Thank you so much, Hannah and Rick. Um, whoever is uh, speaking right now, if you could mute yourself, that way we're hopefully able to hear everyone. Um, but yeah, moving forward, thank you once again, Hannah and Rick. I know there's so much to cover when it comes to talking about um, defunding the police to the Black Lives Matter movement. So we tried our best to at least provide a, a comprehensive understanding of like how we started. Um, so now we're gonna be moving into a discussion um, with our Just a second. Okay, so moving on. So we are going to be joined by um, organizers, David um, for, and also Carvel from Texas Organizing Project based in Dallas, as well as Chaz Moore, the founder and executive director of Austin Justice Coalition. So um, first, if you can introduce yourselves, your organization, as well as a little bit about what's happening in your cities, as well as um, what is your organization working on regarding the issue of police? And if Chaz, if you don't mind starting first. Yeah, uh, first I just wanna say hey to everybody. Um, I'm Chaz Moore, like you said, executive director and founder of the Austin Justice Coalition. Um, currently we are working on encouraging city council and city manager uh, Spencer Crump to take at least $100 million out of the APD budget um, and put that towards um, other things that work um, because we all know that uh, policing does not work when it comes to uh, mental health crisis calls. It does not work with, you know, people that are experiencing um, substance abuse. It does not work for many, many things. So that's our current campaign. And I'll talk a little bit more about that after um, Carville talks. All right, I'm Carvel Bowens, uh, Right to Justice organizer in Dallas. Um, glad to see everybody on this call, uh, especially Chaz and everybody else, Texas Rise, and all the uh, people from all the different organizations. Um, you know, we work in three main counties in Dallas, Bear, and then Houston and Harris County. And so uh, in Dallas, we are specifically fighting to defund DPD, which is part of the um, broader platform um, that, of course, is shared by a coalition here locally in defense of Black Lives and then uh, Movement for Black Lives following that defunding the police platform. So we're trying to support on every level that we can, but we also have a situation going on where we're calling for the firing right now of our police chief who made some very poor decisions against protesters at the very beginning of June, June 1st. And so we're fighting from that aspect of that specific situation that happened. 
as well as um, you know pushing those other platforms, the larger platforms as well. So we're here to support in any manner that we can. Uh, and my name is David Villalobos, Rights of Justice Coordinator out of uh, Dallas, Texas. A um, little bit more about TOP. So um, we uh, do uh, year-round community organizing around issues like immigration uh, reform, uh, education justice, criminal justice reform, um, housing, um, jobs. And then we also try to identify uh, key races where we can really elevate our issue-based campaigns. For example, district attorney races. We've been uh, very, uh, a lot of our work um, happens uh, in these uh, races just to make sure that, you know, we can have, um, you know, a district attorney that steps away from an incarceration first mentality uh, is willing to work with us on progressive policies. And, you know, so we really try to be uh, very strategic on the political races that we jump in. Um, and of course, like Carvel said, we're also in the process of building our own platform that's very intersectional in this defund uh, DPD movement. Um, that's, you know, there's a lot of people throwing down in Dallas and um, just looking forward uh, to that budget battle. Awesome. Thank you guys for sharing about yourselves and the amazing organizations that y'all are part of. Um, and so actually, David, if you could start off this next question. Um, how do you, as an organizer, bring people into the movement who may, who may be hesitant on changing the way that we think about our police system? Yeah, well, one, I think a lot of times, like, just stepping into the movement, we have a lot of new people that have never really been in community organizing spaces. So, you know, just being welcoming, making sure that uh, people, one, uh, they understand what we're doing in regards to like defunding, what that means, so explain that part, but then also bring uh, people's experiences to the table. We have a very uh, diverse uh, membership uh, from all walks of life, and we also have like old school members that they feel that policing is needed in their neighborhoods because that's the only way they've like known uh, to live, um, but then if you like really dissect that idea and really get to the different layers that exist within the policing system, they're like, oh, wow, I never saw it that way. So it's just having these uh, conscious conversations, um, you know, with current members, uh, with new people entering the space. And um, I think that has really uh, worked and been, um, you know, successful, just um, changing people's um, hearts and minds um, in order to do this type of work. Um. So, 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 so what we do is um, we try to frame all the work around anti-racism, right? And we have a slogan um, like hashtag just do the work. And what we try to do is um, one, as an organization, we let people know that you have to um, center the voices of people that have been closest to the problem, which is um, in almost any aspect of any, you know, data pool, any conversation you want to have, is black folk, right? Um, when you look at healthcare, you know, black people, when you look at education, black people, when you look at incarceration, black people, when you look at income inequalities, black people. Um, so, so, so we operate, so, so we operate around that frame. Um, and I think it's really important for me to say this, um, cause it's not said enough. Um, we really operate with the lens of black queer feminist theory, which is, you know, liberation and abolition for all. Um, so, so with that, we understand that um, while we are talking about Black Lives Matter and we are talking about anti-racism, um, we understand that it's not unique. It is um, very much a, a white people's issue, if I can say that. Um, but like, because we live in an American society and because white supremacy and white privilege um, has been deemed a standard, you have people of color, um, Black people and other people of color especially, that also you know, buy into um, like the same things that we're trying to undo. So we really let people know that it's one thing to not condone racism, but like you have to do anti-racist work, right? Because um, racism is, is not going to undo itself, right? So we let people know that if you're not actively trying to combat against these systems and undo them and unpack them and build something new, um, then maybe this is not the place for you. But, um, you, you, you know, we, we try to be as patient as we can, because we know uh, we all, in some form or fashion, contribute to the to the problems of the world. Um, but but it's really just trying to get people to understand that it's more about unlearning than learning something new, right? It's 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 more about unlearning. Like even me as a you know I'm a I'm a black cisgender heterosexual male, 
um, that, you know, that is a felon. Um, but even within that quandary of, uh, in, in concoction of, of identities, I still have privilege, right? I still have more privilege than a black woman with a PhD, right? Like because of male privilege and I have to understand um, that and I have to unpack that and unlearn that as I continue to, to do this stuff. So like we really just try to introduce people into this movement by letting them know like, hey, we don't have the answers, but we're all building this shit as we go. Um, but we know the only way we can get to where we want to go is if we drop and leave all of this shit that we've been taught behind, if that made any sense. And I'm sorry for cussing, but it's after four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want I wanted to add on just a little bit to uh Chaz's point. He he brings up a very good point about having all the different groups and organizations and platforms together. I think that's the main thing about it. Once um the people see our solidarity and how we're looking for liberation for everybody, then they'll take more time to listen to us and speaking um, directly to that question on, you know, bringing people into the movement against this policing system you know, these polarizing facts, these, this $516 million um, dollars that uh, DPD has, you know, when people hear those numbers and they realize just exactly how much money is invested into policing, then they start thinking for themselves and start thinking maybe there is something else we could do with some of that money that would just make the community better overall instead of just investing in policing. But you know, we have to we have to show solidarity like the two people like uh, Chaz and uh, David said, and then we have to um, share the facts. Thank you. No, that was that was um, thank you. Um, and then my next question and Carvel, if you may start. Um, how do we keep the momentum going for addressing the issue of policing in the broader Black Lives Matter movement, especially during a pandemic? Well, um, one simple thing that we have to do as organizers, we had to change the landscape in which we organized. We couldn't physically get out there. So we're, of course, like we are now, we're having to do more online, you know, via the internet and social media. So, you know, that's something that we've had to adapt to. That's, that's becoming a way of life. Um, we have to, which is a good thing because there's a lot of momentum going on on uh, Facebook and other social media. So we just have to keep doing the work that we're doing steadfast with that and, you know, jump on that momentum, you know, dig up leads, find people who want to tell these stories of what's happened to them and all of that, you know, on Facebook and, and find those people and get them into the movement. And just like what Chaz said earlier, you know, we just have to share the, the platforms. We have to first show solidarity that we're all fighting for the same thing and then be willing to stand up for the other people in the platforms as well, as far as liberation for all. So that's, that's just a little bit there. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think a key thing with this current moment um, is showing us, and one thing I really like about TOPS um, that I'm kind of envious of, because with TOPS you can't really point to like the spokesperson, because I think they do a really good job of um, just building organizers internally. Um, and you know, I work with nothing but introverts and they see all the shit that I get. So, so they kind of like, you got it. Um, but I think, I think in this, in, in this time, it's really about, um, building and, and helping other people empower themselves to become their own organizer. Right. Because, you know, me, David and Carvel can't be, um, everywhere. And like, we don't know everybody, but if I can give, um, you know, a Rick, if, if, if we can give Rick the information and tools and resources, he can then disseminate that to the people in his network. Um, and it's just really about, you know, just building individuals in this moment because we know uh, with social media, right? Like on social media, I can't add any more Facebook friends because of that, that rule they got, um, which means I'm missing out on a lot of people. And like not, not a lot of people have access to social media, right? Not everybody has access to, to Wi-Fi or, or things of that nature. So, um, it's really important now to make sure we're empowering and creating other organizers so they can tap into their personal networks and get the information out. Um, so that way it doesn't just fall back on tops or AJC or any groups like that. It's really in this particular moment about, um, you know, like Carvel said, just making sure we all are in solidarity and we all um, amplify our voices to make sure we're all reaching as many people as we can. Since we can't do it, um, or we shouldn't be doing it in, in person. 
Uh, I think uh, Chaz is right on. Just like, you know, creating uh, community organizing spaces where people can really develop skills to become leaders. Like, you know, you hear like she's to become leaders in their community, but that's real. Like, you know, one, after a person does like one interview with the news, they feel like on top of the world, like, yes, I can do this type of stuff. And um, so it's really powerful just to see like the evolution of people as they, you know, climb up the ladder of really being you know, representatives of, of their community. And, you know, that provides the infrastructure uh, for uh, these movements to keep going because there's deep relationship that gets built uh, in these communities uh, between people and their neighbors. Um, and so that's something, uh, you know, again, just creating, continuously creating uh, more organizing spaces is just going to flourish. So um, I think that's very important. And uh, it is like, you know, this uh, concept of everyone, you know, building up the skills so that we can all organize and build a million people, uh, build towards getting a million people on the streets and really demanding the bold policy agenda that we all want. Yeah, thank you all so much for those answers. Um, the next question is, uh, what does the world look like, and this is for Chaz to start, what does the world look like when your organization accomplishes its goal for this issue? Or what does the world look like when you accomplish this goal for you personally? Ac accomplish the goal of defunding the police? Yeah, that and any other kind of goals around. Uh, so, so you know, I think, um, uh, again, um, uh, you know, at <laughs> at ABC, we don't celebrate very long, um, especially in the policy world, right? Um, and I think we've been very, uh, we try to be very transparent with the idea, or uh, with the fact that reform doesn't fix the problems. Um, and I've been trying to give this example for people recently, right? For the people that watch Game of Thrones, reform is nothing more than Hodor, right? Uh, when Hodor was like holding the door so they can keep going, that's what reform is. Like reform is not going to fix anything. It just gives us a moment in time to breathe and hold the system accountable um, as we continue to build this world with better institutions, better systems, and you know equity and equality um, in in a very true manner. So you know when we do things like um, you know Austin became one of the first cities. Um, a couple of years ago to like literally kick the police union's ass like we like we kicked the ass and I think that's important to say because that doesn't happen um, but we also realized that if this doesn't happen anywhere else then this win is kind of like in vain it's 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 a silo um, and even if we even if we can have people kick the police union's ass all over the country um, you know if people are still dying at the hands of police and we still have full prisons we still have full jails then like, you know, okay, like really what's the point? So um, while we think it's important to celebrate those victories, like we can't get stuck in them, right? Um, which is, and I'll say this, and I'll say this on myself, don't say AJC said it, but I think that's a problem with um, some of our long standing organizations like the NAACP, that they talk about what they did 40, 50 years ago um, legislatively, but then like they're not paying attention to the right now. Like they, they really seem to, not be able, you know, like uh, um, like Arville said, they 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 seem to not be able to envision these worlds or, or these communities without these systems that we have become so accustomed to. Um, so you know, right now, I think um, a, a victory, um, yes, would be pulling a hundred million dollars out from the police department and creating um, like this mental health first response where cops don't go and having patrol um, to where if somebody gets in a, a car wreck that we don't have armed officers go. Um, but that's, but, but that's a very like, okay, you know, we won on Tuesday is back to work on, on Wednesday type of thing, because, um, you know, something that I know tops and something that we, we all believe is like, um, until all of us are free, the numbers are free. Right. So, um, I, I really don't know, but I think, you know, a small step would definitely, um, be getting that hundred million pulled out of APD and reallocated somewhere else. Um, and then I also think a victory is just really. Um, getting more people, and when I say more people, you know, just to be completely honest, more people in the, the, the general sense of American context, which is white people, to understand that um, when we think about safety, we also have to unpack that, right? Because safety is not something, um, again, in American context, that's supported to black and brown people. Um, like, safety in, in the American context is what we use to dehumanize and devalue people of color. That's why we have kids and borders uh, because you know we feel like all these people are going to cope in here and and impede on our safety as americans or this is why cops can kill black people because th th their safety of their lives is you know this is why amy cooper can call the cops because somebody's just recording her 
because her safety. But when we talk about our safety, um, you know, it, it's a completely different context. Um, but yeah, I hope that answered the question a little bit. I know Carvel and David gonna clean it up. I guess I'll I'll throw a little bit in. No, I I'm glad that you put that in there. You brought up some great points, Chaz. I mean, ultimately, like this thing would look, you know, if if everything just went well, we wouldn't have a job. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that would be, you know, that would be the ultimate goal. But of course, like Chaz said, you know this reform until we get change of systems and institution we're gonna have to keep fighting and, and we have to be in it for the the full marathon you know um you know i feel that actually this specific issue of defunding the police itself if that's what we're you know calling it right now police accountability is kind of what we've also built up at top but um you know this is just one part of police accountability held accountability is um, understanding that we don't need to invest in policing and controlling people's bodies, but we need to invest in the community. And, and actually, if we want a great America, if we want to make America great, then we need to uh, have communities that are great across this country, not just these communities that are look like this and then these communities that look like this. And, and it takes on a lot of other elements besides uh, just defunding the police, of course, we know that it's divesting and reinvesting. But, um, you know, what we ultimately would like to see is, you know, just people, and when I say people, kind of like what Chaz said, you know, across the board, people from different demographics understand that it's just as important to have, you know, the southern sector of town in a certain condition and feeling a certain way about themselves, a certain um, self-worth you know, when you have these police in your part of town, when you see the way that they operate with people, it makes you feel a certain way about your community and about yourself. And so if we start building up these communities, then, you know, there will, won't be a need for police. And not only will we have less police forces, then we will also have better communities overall because those dollars, those hundreds of millions of dollars, will be going into the community directly, building up people's lives, building up people's self-worth, building up equity, you know? So we, we would just have, we would have a great America is, is what it would look like to me if we accomplished the goal. Yeah, and no, and I think in order uh, to have that, you know, uh, one, I'm really excited about this moment. Uh, I think, you know, there's some real opportunity to really you know, impact uh, not just the policing system, but all the different systems that, you know, have oppressed, you know, our, our uh, African-American uh, community uh, for so long and our uh, communities of color, whether it be um, the public education system, like not only do we want like cops out of school, but, you know, we also want after school programs or uh, special ed uh, to get the proper uh, funding that they need and they deserve. Um, you know, talking about like uh, people not having healthcare access and people literally dying because they don't have medical insurance. like. Um, you know, hopefully if we use uh, this moment right, uh, we can, um, you know, uh, not only, again, like really uh, reform or abolish or again defund uh, these policing systems, but all the, it, it could be a real catalyst um, for all the other, um, you know, systems that really um, hold us uh, down. Um, mass incarceration, like the, the court system, so we're also looking at like site and release, um, you know, to be part of this conversation, site and diversion. Um, you know, so uh, I think if, uh, you know, we use this moment right, it could really have uh, tremendous effects, um, you know, over the next years, decades. And of course, I don't know, like the work will ever stop, but I mean, we can all dream, right? That means everything will be all right. <laughs> yeah, thank you all so much for that. Um, in those visions y'all just described um, for the future, how can young people get involved in those uh, and further those visions. Uh, and David, if you don't mind starting that one. Yeah, so it's like, how can young people get involved, right? Could I cut off a little exactly. bit? Exactly. Yeah, all right. Well, I mean, I think like social media, like the power of social media, like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, like, I mean, wow. Like, I think it's just like on a whole different level. Um, I'm a millennial, but I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't have Instagram, or I have an Instagram, it's not that dope, or I don't have a Twitter, and I know like a lot goes down there, so it's like, you know, I'm looking at you all to like hold it down and spread the word, and you know, um, in order uh, to, you know, not only like, 
um, organized, but really um, changed the mindsets and the hearts again of our larger uh, community. So I think um, those are so uh, such powerful tools that I think our you know uh, young folks um, are able to use really well, and you know just such a powerful tool. So um, I think uh, through that avenue, um, I'm just looking forward, especially in this landscape. Um, you know, I don't know how long we're gonna be um, you know social distancing and this is really like the time to really help build infrastructure on these uh, platforms and uh, organizing plans and you know to make sure um, that we again just achieve uh, these agendas so um, I would say that um, for sure I mean so so for, so for me I think the role of um, of youth and young people is it, it's so pivotal um, you, you know the main reason we started you know, the Austin Justice Coalition was because, um, again, and I'm not trying to pick on the NAACP, but, you know, it, it just is what it is. Um, but because the local chapter here wasn't really um, listening to us and, and they wasn't trying to listen to us. Um, so, you know, we kind of just had to bogart our way into, into the policy realm, into the political conversations, into the social justice conversation in Austin. Um, and I think that's the role of young people, right? I think, um, you know, even with me at 32, I, I don't plan on being at AJC in three years at 35. I would hope some, you know, young black or brown person can come take my spot. Um, even if they don't want to take my spot, I think it's critical that, um, that they hold me accountable and let me know if I'm going down that NAACP route. Um, or, you know, I, I think it's important for, for young folks to, to control the narrative and can control the movement because um as as cool and as i as as hip and as I, in touch i think that i am with like this vision for tomorrow um i think they see things that i'm not quite seeing and that's you know um i mean i think that just speaks volume to like energy and you know the 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 vision that young folks have so you know i think you know the question is kind of a little odd to me because I think that we can't answer that question. Um, I think the youth kind of steer this ship um, a as they always have. When you look at every um, successful movement, whether it's been incremental or, you know, like this, this monumental change, it's always been young people to lead the way. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the question is not, I think that question shouldn't be asked from you all. It, it's like us. Like, what do you all want us to do and how can we do it and how can we pave the way so that way when you all either, you know, take the torch or we pass it, um, things can be a little bit better for you. But, yeah, you know, um, you know, I tell people all the time, the youth and the people that are most oppressed are my boss. That's who I work for. I don't work for, I don't work for you know, city council. I don't work for the mayor. I work for the, I work for the future and I work for the people that are being oppressed the most in this moment. Yeah, I I definitely love what Chaz and what David both said. You know, I'm around David all the time, so I, I hear his views a lot. But even what he said right now was beautiful. And, and Chaz, like, y'all y'all hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's kind, I guess maybe it's kind of befitting that I spoke last because I am like the old head. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm, I'm about to be 40 pretty soon. So, like, I'm, like, in this realm, I'm old, especially the way in the uh, – the times, the, um, how fast things are moving now. But, uh, you know, I heard two things. I heard uh, changing the narrative by Chaz. And then um, the things that David spoke about for social media. I mean, I, I've, I've heard the term, we're all familiar with the term, uh, the revolution will not be televised. And I'm thinking at this point that the revolution may be posted <laughs> on social media, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. tweeted, all of that, <laughs> IG. But, um, you know, honestly, that's it. Like, the young people are making this happen. The, the new generation, that, that's how this is happening. That's how, you know, this hasn't been accomplished already before us. You know, going back to like what Chad was saying about with the NAACP, you know, of course, you have different starting places for different generations. But, you know, um, you have to have people that are willing to be progressive. You have to be progressive because if you're not progressive, then you're stagnant and you're part of the status quo. So it's, you know, nothing will change. You'll be like, you know, 
Joe Biden. I don't want, I'm sorry, I didn't, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I just want to throw that in there. But uh, no, we got to change this narrative. And honestly, all the creative things that the young people have been doing, you know, the artwork that has been part of the movement now, all of this stuff, that, that's what we need, seriously. Like, like we need people to also be part of these organizations and be true organizers, even if you're not within an organization, just organizing your circle, your community, your family, and also keep being creative. Keep, keep being creative, keep pushing the narrative in any way you can, on any platform that you can. We have to have it and, and we will see change. Yeah, and, I, I, and Rick, I just wanna add one thing to that. I think, I, I think one thing that you don't understand is they're more, it, it, like is their most powerful um, weapon is like, like th th this, this freedom to just be right. Like at some point, um, hopefully, I guess, you know, I will settle down with some black woman and have some kids. And then I got to start thinking about all that. But like, when you are just single and free, um, without those type of responsibilities, like you can, it's so much easier for y'all just to be like, um, again, excuse my French, but just like, fuck it. Right. <laughs> like, um, and I think that's the energy that we need. Um, because again, we see a lot of people that they, um, they're in the movement so long that they just become institutionalized within the movement. And you, you know, the, the, the lack of, of, of progression, um, you know, hinders their ability to like really imagine that world where we don't have police. Or imagine a world where we don't need insurance and things of that nature. Or a world where we don't even need money. Um, you know, so I, again, I think I think the, the the future of the world, not just the country, but the world, um, is always going to be steered and directed by the youth. And I, I just believe that to my core. Well, thank you everyone so much for your answers. I feel like we <laughs> touched on so many things. And from those, we actually have a lot of questions. Um, I don't think I will be able to have all of you answer all of them, um, given the time. We only have 15 more minutes, but I'll start reading some of them that have been put in the chat box. So from Sabrina, she asked, um, do you think that endorsing a DA is necessary since they're technically a top cop? Uh, well, I guess like there's a lot of like tug of war with that, right? Because when I saw it, like, oh, stop, like, yeah, no, that's true. Um, but, you know, like considering like the landscape, like where we're at right now, it's like, you know, when we were, uh, so Carvel and I were part of 674 people that were on the bridge that got arrested in Dallas over, you know, we were peacefully protesting, uh, pelted with tear gas, uh, rubber bullets. Um, you know, if not for like, you know, uh, a district attorney that didn't like want to like, you know, uh, put the hammer down on our people, um, and a county judge, um, then um you know i'm pretty sure they're trying to find a way to process 674 people so i think uh in the moment i would say yes and the larger theory of what we're trying to work towards like abolishment of police abolishment of all these court systems um i say no yeah for sure um and and yeah that's like that's a great question it's like it makes us as organizers think of these things and i don't think i've put like much thought into that and, and this is why these spaces are beautiful um Second question um, from Fraterna. Um, what about historical fears that the black community has towards social workers? They carry their own biases. There will still be racism within the system. I didn't know if Chaz wanted to go ahead and step in on that one or. Wait, um, can you repeat it? I'm sorry. No worries at all. So what about historical fears that the black community has towards social work? So when conversations about defunding the police, we've said we would um, allocate that to maybe social work programs, but then it's what of those programs have in them in themselves racism in their system? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and you know, something I've been saying, um, you know, it, like this moment is so much bigger than policing, um, you know, Police are definitely the the most one of the most lethal um, when you just talk about the, the the life of black people and black bodies, brown bodies. But you know, this moment is really about um, America dealing with its original sin, which is colonialism and racism, 
and and oppression and and yeah, an oppression of anybody that's not a white, you know, straight male that has money. Um, and with that, you know, I think police is by far the most deadly institution that we have. But right behind that is um, education. I think the education system is the second most dangerous thing in this country. And then right after that, um, the the public health system, like all of it, like just the health system, all of it, from social workers, like to doctors, whatever. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to, while we're having this conversation around rethinking public safety, we also have to call out the racism and discrimination and anti-blackness that comes with the institution of social work as well. Um, and with that, you know, something that we've been trying to elevate here is, again, if you go back to black queer feminist theory, the solution is investing in the community. Like communities that are black, brown, and indigenous have always been able to take care of ourselves until white people got in the mix, right? Until we were colonized, until um, until their civilization came over here and where black, black and brown, indigenous folks were, that's when things started getting real crazy. Um, and granted, I'm not saying black and brown and indigenous communities were utopian, but we knew how to take care of ourselves. Like restorative practice is a buzzword to white America now, but we've been doing that since the beginning of time. Um, you know, everything, we have our own community-based solutions. We have, we have crisis intervention before it was called crisis intervention, right? We have violence intervention before it was called that. So while, yes, we need to take that money from police and we know some of that money is going to get reallocated to social work and things of that nature, we also have to be willing to invest directly into the communities because they have had the answers from eons ago, right? So, so... <laughs> Okay, one question regarding since it is early voting, soon to be the runoff um, election soon, what are resources do you all recommend for self-educating as we prepare to go to the polls in the coming weeks? I mean, I ain't got nothing for that. All I'm gonna say is vote local. That's all I'm gonna say about <laughs> I, I was going to defer to to David if he wanted to speak on it. Is David well, still mean, with him? I, the first thing that comes to mind is like the legal women voters. <laughs> they like have like this always like this comprehensive. It seems to be like very, um, you know, they're nonpartisan or they try to like tiptoe that line so that comes well. But also like look to your local organizations. Like here at Top, we uh, screen and endorse candidates. We have we send them out questionnaires. Um, you know, we receive them, have follow-up questions, sit them on the hot seat. So it's more than just like giving away our, um, you know, our endorsement. Like people really have to earn it. So, you know, if there's organizations that have processes uh, like that, you know, I would look uh, towards, you know, looking at them and, you know, again, like joining those processes so that you yourself are able to hear from the candidate directly and, you know, make these uh, decisions. Um, so um, that's what I would say for sure, especially like organizations will endorse like, you know, in big races uh, locally or nationally. Thank you. Okay, last big question that I'm pulling from both Lisa, Melanie and Arash. So they asked one, how can, what, who are from the local government young people can pressure? Uh, what is TOP and AJC doing these upcoming weeks that we can get involved with? So kind of those two things built together. And then Melanie, of course, how we can sustain this not only in the weeks, but then months to come. I just, I'll throw in there real quick that, um, you know, right now there's a lot of strategy going on in Dallas County. Our budget vote is coming up towards um, September time probably. So um, we're strategizing our city council, which is one of our main targets, the city council people, as well as the uh, city manager, because we are a, um, I forgot the term right now off the top of my head, but we're led more by the city manager. He conducts the business. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we do have the right targets in place. Uh, we're strategizing with different groups, organizations. Like I said before, we want to go in solidarity. We want to make sure that people kind of have similar platforms, even though people might have different demands that address different you know, levels of government or different situations, but, you know, get ready, find out when your city councils meet, 
find out when the budgets are voted on find out all of that, find out any workshops and committee meetings that they're specifically having before then. Um, you know, I don't know how many different viewers we have from what different parts of Texas, but like I said, going back to Dallas, you know, we're in July, we will be strategizing, you know, all through July. And so, you know, we have meetings going on on Thursdays primarily, on um, Thursday at 6 p.m. They're done on Zoom like this. And, uh, you know, we're getting out the information you can check us out. Primarily, I would go to Facebook to check out top information, uh, Texas Organizing Project. And we also have a website, organizedtexas.org. I can try to throw that in the chat. I saw where people were asking the good questions in the chat. But, you know, you can, um, you know, we found, we, we have some things coming up for our um, chief of police, but of course, she's just more like a figurehead in the situation. So it's like uh, David stated earlier, it's a budget fight. So it's going to take place in your city halls. It's going to take place uh, with those managers. Yeah, I think for us, um, I put a link in there. If if you live in Austin, if you can fill out the, um, that tool that we just built, and this is the first time that that company has used it for a grassroots organization. Um, and I, I'll briefly tell you why it's important. So the city put out a budget survey, but it only allowed you to take about 20% from the police budget and then reallocate it somewhere else. But with the budget we made, and this is a very high level, like not too far in the weeds, um, you can take as much money you want from the police department and put it elsewhere. Um, and what we're doing is we're taking demographics and we're taking zip codes, if you feel comfortable putting that in there. And that way we'll, we'll be able to see who is saying um, we need to defund the police or for the people that even try to raise the police budget they have to t they would have to take that money from like animal services you can't just raise it like you have to um balance it or have a surplus you can't have like a, a a deficit budget um so we we really think it's important to get this out to as many diverse voices in austin as possible um and we have this the english version and the spanish version because that's like the second highest language spoken here outside of um um american or english so if you all can please fill it out it takes about um, five minutes, eight minutes if you're like a, a wonk, a policy wonk like me. Um, but it's a really cool tool. So hopefully people will use it. And then also sign our petition to get rid of Chief Manley because he's trash. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I hear you. Uh, well, just to like finish off, um, one, we have a community bailout project as well uh, at top where we're identifying people uh, that needed to get bonded out. There's a lot of people that are in there for simple possession, uh, criminal trespassing. Uh, it's ridiculous. So every day we get jail rosters, um, but it's cumbersome to like go through them, uh, you know, every day. But that's what we do, and we could always uh, use help with that. Um, so uh, also, Carvel said we're gonna keep it consistent Thursdays at 6 p.m. Uh, also, drop our uh, hallmustgo.com. Um, that's our petition to fire Chief uh, Hall from uh, the Dallas Police Department. Uh, and uh, that's it. But yeah, I just want to throw like our community bailout project. We can definitely need some help with that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, David, Carvel, Chaz, for being on here. The, it's been an amazing conversation. I feel like I've learned so much and I hope everyone else on here knows how we can plug in to also stay informed about how we can help with defunding the police while also continuing this effort, um, the anti-racist um, agenda, so we can <laughs> get shit done. Um, so if everyone, I know we're very, very close to the end of the time for our training, but I do have um, some calls to action and resources that I hope people can access and look at real quick. So going back to the slideshow, so we have um, the calls to actions. Please reach out to your regions um, for local text things and events. So we have a presence all here on this match, um, map from um, Dallas-Fort Worth, El Paso, Austin, Central Texas, San Antonio area, Houston, and RGV. Um, not saying that we are the ones that are leading the efforts, but we can be a really great source of contact for you to get plugged in with local organizations like TOP and AJC, um, as well as other local efforts that are happening. And I believe in like Dallas, El Paso, San Antonio, they're doing text banks. Houston's doing educational events, um, as well as like calls to action. Austin's also doing text banks. So <laughs> there's many, many different ways that you can get involved if you're able to contact us. Um, 
the other thing, so we have a long list of things. So ways to attend Texas Rising Text Banks and events, you can go to texasrising.org slash defund the police, Texas. Um, that's where we have our great resource page where you can connect to not only local organizations, you can connect to us. And then we even created a resource list because we know there are ways for us to be better um, either pushing this agenda to being better allies to just educating ourselves on this issue. And so we create a resource list that includes videos to podcasts to books to general websites whatever you can think of um, to educate yourself on how to be anti-racist. Um, that's basically it. That was a very quick wrap up, but I hope that was comprehensive for everyone. Um, making sure that if there's no more further questions, I think I will just say that I will make sure to send all these resources as well as the contact information on how to reach um, David or Carvel to also Chaz. Um, via email for all who have attended thank you so much for your time to also um, for your input to also all your questions i hope we can all um, be involved together in this effort so we can further advance um, not only just defunding the police but also just um, holding police accountable during this time and to continue this momentum so thanks everyone i hope you all have a great evening and i can't wait to see um, what the future lies ahead for texas rising and all these amazing organizations so thank you, thank you. we're signing off for now <laughs> thank everyone Bye. thank you have a good day you too thank you gracias, adios. Thank you, gracias.